Here's a poorly kept secret. Oregon's Tualatin Valley is home to the giant sequoia. These redwoods, which shelter the Catholic Church in Verbort, are just toddlers in comparison to the ancient redwoods of California. But 2,000 years from now, they will be 30 feet in diameter. How did the giant sequoia find its way to Oregon? The story begins a long time ago, during the California Gold Rush. In 1852, gold fever was cooling at Calaveras. But the miners still had to be fed. They considered bears to be man-eaters. But to tell the truth, the miners relished bear meat. The hired hunter from Murphy's camp, Augustus Dowd, shot a bear in the high Sierra woods. Dowd followed the wounded animal into an unexplored forest. As evening descended, he chanced upon the enormous trunks of giant sequoias. Abandoning his prey, Dowd hurried back to camp to announce his discovery, but his story was not believed. When he finally enticed others to the grove of giants, he shouted to the amazed miners, Now, boys, do you believe my story? Tools to fell such a tree had not yet been invented. Nevertheless, it took only a year for the Calaveras loggers to devise a way to cut the first one down. It had been standing for over 2,000 years. As loggers descended upon the Sierras, President Lincoln signed a bill to create the Mariposa Big Tree Grove State Park. This was the nation's first act of wilderness preservation. The Big Tree is nature's forest masterpiece, and, so far as I know, the greatest of living things. John Muir. In 1876, John Muir began his campaign for wilderness protection. The Converse Basin, which Muir considered the equal of the Mariposa Grove, was utterly destroyed. Meanwhile, a handful of these trees were beginning to be planted in Europe and the United States. But more than anywhere else, the sequoia found its new home in Oregon, thanks to the efforts of one man. It was my grandfather that did it. He went as a young man to the gold rush in California. In 1851, John Ramsey Porter left California with enough gold dust to fill a cigar box. He just missed Dowd's discovery. He returned to this community, West Tuolity Plains. John filed for a land claim next to the one owned by his father. A year later, when the Leverage family moved to the area, he began to court young Permelia. By 1854, when John and Permelia wed, West Tuolity Plains had been renamed Forest Grove. Soon John acquired 30 more acres, perfect for a great nursery, his trees supplied the orchards being established all over Oregon to feed the hungry pioneers. Porter's nursery opened in 1858, and a year later, Permelia was pregnant with their first child. Then, suddenly, Porter decided to start over again in California. Porter's granddaughter, Marjorie Porter Van Dyke, believes he missed the sunny weather. And then come home in summer and live and, and, and take care of the farm and then go back to California. They were in love with it. The Porters bought a farm for their new family near Oakland. Their marriage was, however, marked by long separations. On alternate years, first husband and then wife booked steamer passage to Oregon to visit their parents. But this lonesome migratory life could not go on forever. 
In 1869, while John was visiting his wife and family in Forest Grove, his California home burned, possibly as a result of arson. The Porters then settled in Oregon for good. But Porter left the gold country with a gunny sack full of sequoia cones. Shortly after settling in, Porter sprouted the tiny seeds in his nursery, and they grew. These were among the first sequoia gigantea to grow in Oregon since the last ice age. As these petrified stumps in Colorado demonstrate, 30 million years ago, redwood giants were widely dispersed. During the 1870s, Porter planted trees to shade the road to his home. They thrived in the valley's climate better than anyone would have expected. Today, Oregon's biggest sequoia graces downtown Forest Grove. It's 32 feet in circumference. Well, I, uh, I imagine he would guess that they'd grow forever. In 1883, Porter gave 21 seedlings to the Dutch immigrants for the new Visitation Catholic Church. Twelve apostles were planted on the church's front lawn. So the school children helped the priest hold the trees while he planted them. Giants were also planted at Forest Grove's finest homes where they lend a strong character to its skyline. Porter provided other trees to grace Washington County's new courthouse in Hillsboro. Then, in the 1890s, a second wave of sequoia fascination swept Oregon. Having a sequoia in the yard became a status symbol. These trees appeared on the heights of Portland's sleeping volcano, Mount Tabor, and far south of the city in Monmouth and Eugene. Sequoia dendrum gigantium has found new homes all over the Tualatin and Willamette Valleys. But the big trees are not entirely safe in the city. About the time Porter began raising sequoias, pioneer judge William Waldo planted this one on his property in Salem, says Oregon's big tree hunter, the popular author, Maynard Drossen. This is Sequoia gigantium. Judge William Waldo. Now the Wald Waldo's made a big mark in Oregon. There's the Waldo Hills out here, and there's a, his father Waldo. By 1936, the tree was beginning to interfere with the expansion of Summer Street, and the city council was determined to remove it. The Waldo tree was saved by uh, a group of uh, mothers, and they convinced the uh, city council that they were pretty strong and they were pretty. Uh, sure that that tree should stay and the city council went back in the recess and said that uh, god these women you know you just can't turn them down and you just can't insult them so they came back out and said well if you take care of it you know put a light on it and all that uh, we'll, we'll save it and they did <laughs> they put a light on it for a long long time and i can remember the light that was on that tree when i was a kid we come back up Summer Street, and there would be that one cord with one bare light sitting on that dang thing. Today, many urban planners have unwritten rules against using this tree. It takes up too much space, they say. Imagine what would happen if one of its limbs were to fall, they add. It's a miracle that the trees have survived the pressures of urban development. That miracle is called the Oregon Heritage Tree Program. Many other organizations can protect the trees too. This tribute to John Ramsey Porter was erected by the Washington County Historical Society. Oregon's last wave of interest in the redwood occurred in the 1920s. OSU forestry professor T.J. Starker directed the planting of many giant sequoias in Corvallis, and others were planted throughout the state. Well, uh, T.J. Starker was, uh, uh, he was an early uh, lumberman, and T. 
TJ Starker was very impressive when it came to saving trees, but utilizing trees. He took over lands that were already logged. Now his family has a Starker Enterprises, and I want to tell you they've done a wonderful job of, of logging. They do logging, but they still preserve the trees that need to be preserved. And uh, this redwood... Near Buxton, Washington County is about to create a sprawling state park. What role can the Sequoia play in defining a unique character for this tourist destination? State policy favors only planting native species in the country, but the Sequoia is no invasive species. Only a small percentage of its seeds sprout, typically after fire prepares the ground. Drought resistance and fire resistance make it a good choice. But uh, redwoods, I don't think there's any other tree in the United States is more compatible to being in a public park. I think that the redwood trees belong in Oregon. Imagine the grandeur of such a grove after about 70 years. You bet. I'm very, very proud of our Heritage Tree Program because it brings people to all parts of Oregon for a tree. Meanwhile, these majestic trees redefine the character of the Tualatin Valley. They're the longest living thing on earth. Oh, I have a sense of pride. I just think that that he recognized the worth of them, and, and, and I'm so proud that they're up around the Verbert Church and around the courthouse. They've returned after a long, long absence. If protected, they will outlast us by thousands of years.